Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is a best-selling author and a world leader in the field of inherited family trauma, Mark Wolin. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our show is titled DNA, Are Our Ancestors Acting Through Us? You're about to engage in one of my all-time favorite podcasts with a man of true genius, love, and humility. I read his award-winning book, It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle when it first came out and knew that what he was sharing was true from my own clinical experience and personal life experiences. I put his book to work and begin using the questionnaires he offers in my clinical practice with consistently great results. I had the joy of seeing long-held pains and emotions over the loss of loved ones heal. I saw that the belief that because I have the cancer gene or the fat gene, dissolve into an awareness and presence in people that were taught the healing practices offered by our guest, Mark Wu Lin. Many of you are very aware, I'm sure, that people go get a diagnosis or do some kind of genetic testing and then use that as a sort of a scapegoat to not participate in their life, be it the fat gene, or as I said, the cancer gene, or any number of them, and just think that it's doomsday for them, and that's the way it's going to be for them, because that's the way it's been for all their ancestors. And it's those kinds of things, and much more, that Mark Wu Lin and I dive into. In this potent interview dialogue with Mark Wu Lin, we dive into the following issues and more. The mechanisms of DNA transfer of not only genetic information, but thoughts, feelings, and traits from our ancestors. Why the Chinese and other cultures have worshipped their ancestors for thousands of years, and what happens when we don't. The important relationship between attachment trauma, which is related to the initial two years of a child's life and relationship to its parents, and ancestral transfer via the DNA, and how to differentiate ancestral trauma from attachment trauma, which is very important. We get into Mark's conception of the soul from his own experiences of helping himself and others heal. We look at an interesting question that I've had due to some work I've done with clients that have had problems related to losing a twin in utero. So I asked Mark if a lost twin can be affected, or the shall I say it, if a surviving twin can be affected by the one that was lost. And it's a quite an interesting conversation. We look at the importance of looking at what Mark calls our greatest fear and our core sentence as clues to where to look within our ancestry to locate the potential source of our challenging physical health emotional health, mental health, and other such challenges, and how that's related to our ancestry. We get into how to determine if you need professional help to unravel and heal from inherited family trauma, and we get into much more. In this interview, I was surprised, as was Mark, to find that we have a common bond and a teacher that has served us and many we've helped through his teachings and work in the field of past life regression, and that was an exciting moment for both of us. Mark admitted to me that he shared things he's never shared before in this interview, and I was very proud of him for letting his soul shine with me in ways he often has to avoid in traditional medical circles so his core teachings get across and are used to help others. I absolutely love and appreciate Mark Wu Lin and know that he is a divine gift to all of us, and I suspect you will share that appreciation with me by the end of this truly amazing interview dialogue with a very special man, Mark Wu Lin. Get ready to learn a lot. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D. Today, I have a guest I've been wanting to interview for a long time, and he was gracious enough to get back to me and join us. And that is Mark Wu Lin, who wrote the amazing book, It Did Not Start With You, or It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. This book is the winner of the 2016 Nautilus Book Award in Psychology, and Mark's book has now been published in over 22 languages. His articles have appeared in Psychology Today, Mind Mind Body Green, Maria Shriver, Elephant Journal, and Psych Central, and his poetry has been published in The New Yorker. And I would just like to say that when Mark's book first came out, 
my soul said, buy it and read it. So I, I always do that when I'm directed by the soul inside of me. And it was obvious to me from my own clinical experience and the work that I do that this was ringing all the truth bells for me. So I immediately printed out all the questionnaires, did the work myself, found it very helpful and started using it with pretty much all my clients with the exceptions of those that didn't have things that were specifically that I thought that was important for. And everybody got results. And many of my clients now have followed up with Mark or done uh, work with him through his workshops. And this is the real deal. So Mark, welcome to Living 4D with me, Paul Check. Hey, Paul, thank you for having me. I'm psyched to get into this. Yes. So, Mark, could you start by sharing an encapsulation of your background and what led you into focusing on inherited family trauma? Because that's really not a pathway that most therapists, psychologists, or doctors take. It's, it's, it's almost esoteric in some ways, but now, of course, backed by science. So I'm really curious, what, what shaped you to end up going down that path? Two, two things. Well, one, I lost, personally, I lost vision in my eye and I was told I'd go blind and that led me on a journey. But I, I think probably the more interesting story is something specific that happened to me about 30 years ago. It was a time when I was working with many self-injurers and there was one case that would change my life forever. This was really the first case that taught me how to look for inherited family trauma. I, I was working with this one young woman, um, 24 years old. I'll, I'll call her Sarah just for the sake of the interview. And uh, Sarah would cut in such an extreme way. In other words, she would cut so deeply that she'd hit a, a vein or an artery and she'd almost bleed to death. And then her parents, they'd have to rush her to the hospital and, and she'd be placed in a psych ward for three or four weeks at a time. And my question really at that time was, what, what, what's going on? I'd worked with many other cutters, many self-injurers, and their cutting was more superficial. What was it about the way Sarah was cutting? That, that What was trying to be communicated here? Because I'm always looking for what's underneath. And one day when she was released from the psych ward, um, I handed her here a pen and I said, here, Sarah, um, take this pen and pretend it's your knife and just imagine, just show me what happens. So she's taking the pen and she would cut either into her arm or leg or abdomen, but I'm having her hold the pen to her arm and I say, bring it close to your skin and just show me what happens. And I could see her eyes glazing over. I could see she's dissociating. And I said, right there, what's that, what's that thought? What's that feeling? What's that impulse right there? And she looks at me, Paul, and she said, I, I don't deserve to live. Now, here I am looking at a 24-year-old person whose life has just begun. And, and I said, Sarah, what have you done? What have you done? Did you accidentally to cause an accident or take a life? Did you break up with somebody who took his life? And she goes, no, nothing like that. And so I just did what I knew how to do. I looked in her childhood at a relationship with her parents, and it was great. She loved her parents. Her parents were awesome. And, and I said, well, it has to be an attachment. So um, we, I started going early, and I could see, no, nope, not there either. She's able to take in her mother's love. Um, she had a strong, safe, secure attachment. And luckily, something in me knew to ask this question. So I said, okay, tell me about the rest of your family. Tell me about your grandparents. And boom, she drops the bomb. The story was her dad's mom was an alcoholic. And she had been driving the car drunk. Grandpa was in the passenger seat. Grandma, drunk, hits a telephone pole. Grandpa goes through the glass, the windshield, and gets cut, lacerated on the glass, and bleeds to death before the ambulance could arrive. And in that moment, the whole story is, is right there. When she tells me, which later we'll talk about 
her verbal trauma language. When she says, I don't deserve to live, it's not her feeling. It's not her sentence. Grandma, who takes the life of another, her beloved, would feel she doesn't deserve to live. And then the nonverbal trauma language, which we'll get into later, why she's cutting so deeply and almost bleeding to death, is because this really does happen to her grandfather. He is cut so deeply, he does bleed to death. So immediately, I was a student of psychodrama back then, and I knew I had an idea what to do. I put two chairs out in the, in the floor of the office, and I said, Sarah, look out there at the two chairs. Your grandfather's in that chair. Your grandmother's in that chair. And tell your grandfather, who she'd never met, by the way, because he died when the father was 12. Tell your grandfather what you do. Okay, Grandpa, I cut myself. Tell him how deeply you cut yourself. Grandpa, I cut myself so deeply, I, I almost die. I almost bleed to death. Tell him like you did, Grandpa. And now she's crying and she goes, I almost bleed to death like you did, Grandpa. And I said, close your eyes. And what's he, show, what's he telling you? What's he showing you? She's saying, he doesn't, he doesn't want me to do this. He said that when I go to cut, to feel him with me supporting me. Uh, which later she'll do, and she never cuts again. But then I have her turn to the chair of her grandmother. And I said, tell her what you told me was the sentence when you cut. Tell her, Grandma, I told Mark, I don't deserve to live. And I can see that that's not my sentence. That's your feeling. And she tells her grandmother this, and she's crying, and she's really having this experience of her grandparents being there that she's talking to in these chairs. And the grandmother says the same thing. When you go to cut, you feel me with you supporting you. And this would shape everything for me, Paul. This idea that I teach in the book how to feel comfort and support from the ancestors. Um, anyway, she, I tell her, well, go home tonight. When you go to cut, see what happens when you feel them there with you. And of course, she goes to cut, but she feels supported, and she doesn't cut. Instead, she feels this massive influx of love coming from her grandparents that she's never met. And, you know, for Sarah, she needed to know that this feeling of needing to die was not hers, and that she could do something about this feeling. And, and, you know, it goes even deeper. I say, Sarah, bring your father in here which I did. And so I go, Sarah, sit in this couch. Her, her name's not Sarah, but I'm just, you know, um, for the sake of the interview, I'm just going to, I say, Sarah, sit in the couch over here. And I work with her dad. And I do the same thing. I have him put his, you know, two chairs out there. And uh, I ask him, tell me what happens behind your grandmother. I mean, your mother, which is Sarah's grandma, because he had rejected his mother for killing his father. He was 12 years old. She was dead of alcohol poisoning by the time he's 20. Um, and she couldn't grieve, he couldn't grieve the father all the way because every time he tries to get in contact with the grief, he has this terrible image of his, the guy, his father dying, bleeding to death on the street. And the rage it blocks the grief that he has toward his mother. So it's stuck right there. So when we look behind his mother, we see that she was given away as a baby to foster care. And now all of a sudden he has compassion and understanding why she drank, why she had to drink. You know, there's given away so early, there's a positive of dopamine. And so she's needing to drink to substitute. She's needing to create a brain state to substitute what wasn't able to have been given to her by her own mother. So he gets that. And he's able to heal his relationship with his mom grieve his father. And the most beautiful thing is what happened at the end. He stands up, he turns to Sarah and he says, you leave this with me. I've got this, which was profound. You could see her just <sighs> let out this breath. She never cut again. And that changed my life, that story. Yeah, well, rightfully so. And, and, and if you look at the kinetic effect of that it's changed the lives of probably millions of people now because without that story you probably wouldn't have had the deep sense of direction to write the book 
oh, uh, it, it changed my life. I mean, and after that, I met Bert Hellinger, who was the father of family constellations, and I became one of his first students in the United States. And, you know, the rest is history. But you're right. This story taught me that, you know, we're not just looking at the childhood. We're not just looking at attachment. We need to look at several generations of history that sit behind us. Yes. Could you please give us an overview of what inherited family trauma is and the sources from which it emerges, such as parental influences or parents being uh, parental influences on parents being passed to their children and DNA transmission? Now, you've given us a great sort of experience, but I'm really wanting it if you could share the mechanism of what inherited family trauma is. So that someone listening, because a lot of people, you know, in my work doing things like past life regression, soul recovery, a tremendous number of people just shut off and say, oh, that's just woo woo. And they don't listen to something that's real. So I, I would love it if you can put it in language that the average person could connect the dots and go, oh, I, I can I can see the mechanism. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, so, firstly, let, let's say that one of our parents or grandparents l lost their mother or father when, when they were young, or our mother or father was sent away or placed in an orphanage, or, uh, or maybe one of dad's siblings or mom's siblings died tragically. An event like this can break the heart of the family. The reaction to the trauma doesn't necessarily stop with the people who experienced it. The feelings and the sensations, specifically the stress response, the way the genes express, can pass forward to the children and grandchildren, affecting them in a similar way, even though they didn't personally experience the trauma. And, and to understand this, we've got to look at the science. So when a trauma happens to us, it changes us. Literally, it causes a chemical change in our DNA. And this can change how our genes function, our genes function sometimes for generations. Technically, after a trauma, a chemical tag or an epigenetic tag will attach to the DNA and tell the cells to use or ignore certain genes, enabling us to better deal with this trauma that just took place. And then the way our genes are affected will change how we act or feel. For example, we'll become sensitive or reactive to certain situations that are similar to the original trauma, even if that trauma occurred in a past generation, so that we have a better chance of surviving it in this generation. Uh, I'll give you an example. If our grandparents came from a war-torn country, so people are being shot in the street, uh, bombs are going off, uh, uniformed men are lining people up in the square, people are being taken away, our grandparents, they would develop a, a skill set. They would develop and pass forward a skill set, let's say sharper reflexes, quicker reaction times reactions to this violence that's going on to help us survive us you see in the next generation it's to help them survive but they're passing it forward so it's to help them and us survive this trauma that they've just experienced now they've passed this forward and the problem is you know we could inherit their stress response with the dials set to 10 and here we are not born born in wartime prepared for a catastrophe that's never arriving. And we're on edge, man. We're not making this link. Um, we, we don't make the link that our anxiety, our hypervigilance, our depression, uh, it's connected to our parents or grandparents. We just think that we're wired this way, Paul. We walk through life going, well, this is how I am. I'm just like this. I get into a crowd and and I close up or I see someone, a policeman in a uniform and I shut down, you know, and we're learning that these gene changes 
These are transmitted to our children and even to our children's children. Right. I suspect you've probably heard me talk about the pain teacher before on this podcast. The pain teacher comes to quicken consciousness and awaken us to habits, patterns of behavior, or diet and lifestyle factors, such as addictions, that we often act out unconsciously, reflexively. When you acknowledge pain as your teacher and really bring awareness to the issues at hand, you realize how incredibly beautiful the human design really is. Well, as we all know, the world has had a major visit from the pain teacher lately. But the point of the pain teacher is that it is a teacher, and until we learn to pay attention and participate affirmatively, the pain teacher only comes back stronger and stronger every time. This is an opportunity for learning and growth every time we fail, every time we injure ourselves, every time we have a relationship breakdown or get sick. The world is learning a lot about what we really value right now. In fact, even though the economy is opening up, more and more people are quitting their jobs. Why? Because they realize the importance of having a career with meaning that aligns with their values. That's something most companies and jobs just don't offer. If you're one of those people, if you're looking for a meaningful career helping people create more health, vitality, and freedom in their lives, then here's my suggestion. Go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy now to learn more about the Czech Academy. This is the elite education system I built with Gavin Jennings, our CEO, to teach you all of the skills as a therapist and business owner to become one of the best holistic health and performance practitioners on the planet. It's helped people launch successful careers in training athletes, in corporate wellness, spinal rehabilitation, helping clients with chronic metabolic diseases, mental, emotional, and spiritual challenges, and so much more. And you can complete the entire system for much less than it will cost you to go to college and start making an income while you're in training. If you're ready for a change or to add a powerful new dimension to your skill set and be the change the world needs now, it's time to apply for the Czech Academy at chekinstitute.com L number 4D Academy. That's chekinstitute.com L 4D Academy. We look forward to all of you joining us to make the world a better place. With your knowledge and your experience, It must be quite an interesting experience for you to be witnessing what's going on with this pandemic right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, the pandemic is shaking the container that we all share in a sense, this collective um, trauma. But what it's doing is it's bubbling up our own, uh, you know, we've got isolation, we've got loneliness, we've got separation. And what it's doing is it's um, bubbling up to the surface all our internal pieces that maybe we've done a good job at blocking or defending against. And now we can no longer block or defend against these early traumas that may have occurred, you know, in infancy or you know when we were separated from our mom or when we were in an incubator or when our dad left. You know, all this stuff is bubbling up to the surface. So it is absolutely a, um, uh, you know, I want to say that in a way that there's a, um, if we could look at the pandemic positively, it's forcing us to look at our own personal traumas and its impact on our children and grandchildren. The sad part is, is probably a fraction of 1% are aware enough to realize what's actually happening while the rest of them are getting highly addicted to alcohol, drugs, uh, you know, something like the average person has gained 16 to 20 pounds from isolating and, and medicating with food, you, you know, so part of the reason I wanted to do this podcast with you is to help people be aware that what's going on right now is a real opportunity for healing if they use the opportunity for healing. And for a lot of people that are working from home or have reduced hours or have lost a job, they're, they're sort of sitting around trying to uh, medicate themselves with television, which turns out to be the virus <laughs> spreading device, unfortunately, in my opinion. So if, if people 
are aware that right now, when we have a trigger mechanism to bring the unconscious up to the surface and work with it and not be overwhelmed by it and realize that behind every cloud of gray is a silver lining, as Napoleon Hill said in his book, Think and Grow Rich, that we can take advantage of this time to do some healing and do some introspection and, you know, read your book. Because the one thing I love about the book is you gave lots of stuff that people can do for themselves. It's not like, oh, now I know I'm screwed up. Yeah. And I don't have I don't have the money to hire Mark. I mean, I've used your book and all the tools that you gave extensively, and I've been able to help a lot of people, including myself. You know, that's that's why I wrote the I wrote the book for two I wrote it for the clinician who could, like you, take the tools and apply them. And I also wrote the book for the airport reader who knew nothing. But I'm thrilled I'm thrilled to hear that you're doing that because that that's that ma- that makes it all that much more gratifying to know that you could just read the book and apply the tools and help people. Oh, absolutely. And and you know, fortunately for me as we discussed before we went onto the recording, I have a long enough background and a diverse enough background that the tools that you offered were a natural fit for the way I see the world and my therapy practice and and you know what the human psyche is, what human life's all about. So it wasn't like I had to make a, a gestalt shift. It was like, oh okay, this is this is a clear path and I'd be a fool to not test this because it's too obvious and, and everything in my heart said use these tools, you know. No, it's just lovely to hear, Paul. Yeah. Now, you've shared uh, an example. My next question was, could you share some examples of the kinds of challenges people were dealing with that cleared up after doing inherited family trauma work with you, be they physical, emotional, or mental? Maybe you could just give us a couple of maybe uh, like a little reader's digest of a couple of different examples on maybe from a different front. Yeah, no, I'll talk about, uh, I'll just share a, a case. I can do it pretty quickly. Um, be, and it, it's a case that um, uh, of physical symptoms, and many of us are struggling with physical symptoms. Uh, a 16-year-old boy um, came to me with a rare neurological disorder that started when he was 10. He began at 10 years old uh, having these intense burning sensations on his skin, and the doctors they they couldn't figure out what was going on. Why this was happening? They couldn't find any root cause. You know, they just—it's a neurological disorder. Um, was the best that people could say, but they, it was idiopathic, no root cause that they could determine. And when I spoke with his mom, I started fishing in the family history, and I started asking questions about his dad. And she said that his father, when he was ten, was playing with matches and accidentally set the garage on fire and the house burned down, but the father's brother was in the house and the father's brother died and the father never forgave himself, which is horrific, just horrific to imagine. But because the trauma, because of the amount of grief and blame, self-hatred, self-loathing, etc., because the trauma remained unhealed and unresolved, which is one of the, uh, I'm a big, believer that we've got to do our own work so it doesn't pass forward. But because it remained unhealed and unresolved, the man's son expressed symptoms, the burning sensations on his skin around the same age. And the family had never made this connection. But now, but now after working with the family, the boy's symptoms subsided. And, you know, it's just a... Excellent. Yeah, just an, a quick example. Yeah. I can I can leave it there. It's it's so and let the story talk about it. You know, let just let that example resonate. Yeah, I I think I think it's fairly clear. You know, the Chinese culture and some other cultures put a lot of importance on worshiping parents and ancestors, which is not so common in the Western culture. What do you feel influenced the Chinese and others to place so much emphasis on ancestral worship? They knew. They knew that our relationship with our parents is important in that it and our relationship with ancestors but particularly our relationship with our parents because we all struggle 
with what we didn't get. But this relationship with our parents creates a template that forges our later relationships and drives our early traumas really to continue repeating. So I talk about in the book, Hey, to Heal, we've got to lose the story we have about our parents. Because I found the more that we reject our parents, the more we suffer. What's unhealed in us continues to live on inside us. And healing with them, all it means really is that we're in tune with what we, with what they could give as well as what they could not give. So we're just in tune with that. You know, my folks could, you know, they could give money, but they weren't very loving or they were, you know, I, I get it. You know, we don't, we don't become fixated on something we believe that our parents have done to us that has spoiled our lives because that just keeps us locked into, into the morass. We know that whatever we reject, whatever we try to push away, continues on inside us on a subterranean level. So when we reject our parents, Paul, we unconsciously reject aspects of ourselves. I mean, we just do. We can't. In other words, when we reject our parents, we disown that behavior in ourselves. What we don't like in them, we can't see when we're the same because we've disowned it in us. So it, what we reject yes. in them expresses... Shadow. Un- Shadow, exactly. What we reject in them expresses in us unconsciously. That's one way we're affected by re- rejecting our parents. Another way is we'll pull in a partner who treats us similarly to the way we felt the parent treat us. So if we felt the parent was cold, we pull in a partner who's cold. If the parent was shut down, we pull in a partner who shuts down. Or we pull in a nice partner, but because we're waiting for them to treat us coldly or to shut down, we we almost make them shut down. For example, we, we look just waiting for them to be unkind or to not hear us, to not see us. And after a while, the partner says, man, this person just doesn't trust me. And, and then we've, cr- we've contributed to this dynamic. Um, the third thing is that we'll treat ourselves, the child part of us, the way we feel the parent treated us. So, for example, when our inner image is that our parents couldn't be gentle with us, we have difficulty being gentle with the child part inside us. Or we'll do to ourselves what we believe the parent did to us. If the parent was critical or aggressive, we become self-critical or inwardly aggressive. Or if the parents ignored us or were distant with us, we're distant with our inner child. We, we ignore that child part of us. You know, I talk about this in the book, but I think it's worth saying here, Paul. Um, Harvard, back in 19, in the 1950s, asked one question to their students, to these 21 year old med students. They said, Hey, tell me about your relationship with your parents. Check a box. It was either warm and close. That was the first box. It was friendly. That's the second box. It was tolerant. That was the third box. Or it was strained and cold. And that was the fourth box. And it was a longitudinal (laughs) study. They followed these people for 35 years. And they looked at them again at age 56. 91% of the people who checked the box, strained, cold, tolerant with the mother, And the father was similar, but with the mother had a significant health issue. 91% of them had coronary artery disease, diabetes, um, uh, some cancer, um, compared with only 45%, Paul, who checked warm, friendly, close. The same number, similar numbers with the father, 82 and 50%. It's amazing. And if you'd rejected both your parents, it was 100%. You had a significant health condition. So healing with, healing with our parents is not just a good idea. It, you know, remaining broken with them could cost us our lives. And, and, you know, so I always ask this question, can we take in their love and care, not as we expected, because of course we want it to be different. 
but can we take it in as they gave it? At least can we hold it inside of us, hold hold them inside of us differently? Now, that doesn't mean throw yourself in front of a moving train and go back and heal with your parents who are going to hurt you. It doesn't mean that. Sometimes this work has to be done inwardly in our inner images, and it can't be done, and it cannot be done on the outside. I say this in the book, reconciliation. Reconciliation is mostly an internal movement. But when our parents be, I call it an inside job, you know, an inside. But when our parents' behaviors are challenging, it helps to ask what traumas happened to them or behind them that blocked love from going to them and then blocked love from coming to us. What traumas made them behave in a certain way? Because understanding this, takes things out of the realm of personal, what's personal. And instead, we begin to understand that any parent who experienced this type of trauma um, or inherited it from their parents would not have much love to give, or, or they'd be hurtful or volatile, or volatile with their children. You know, to simply put, traumatic events block the flow of love. That, that's it. Traumatic events block the flow of love. And, and our parents could have closed their hearts. And then when we close our hearts, we're just continuing the trauma, man. We're just adding another train, another caboose to the train. Um, you know, uh, another way, another way to say it, hurt people, hurt people. I mean, we all know that phrase, hurt people, hurt people. And, it, you know, it doesn't excuse what they did, but it certainly helps to explain. And this understanding can free us to heal those relationships inwardly, or if we're doing a good job inwardly, take the show on the road and do it in person, outwardly. And this can be a, a potent avenue to healing the brain's stress response that keeps us locked in a state of, stru- of suffering. Yes. So I've got three notes that I wrote down while you were talking, because there's, there's things I want to dialogue with you a little bit about. One. One of the things that I think would help everybody, even it's hard to teach this to children because they're children, but we each have a different love model. And I, 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 for example, my first son and I, he's 41 now, we've had a hard time because I was, you know, he was born when I was just, I just turned 18 two weeks before he was born and I had to. My both our my wife's parents and my parents were broke. I had to work my ass off to support them, and and I had to you know turn myself on full force to carry the weight of being a father at the age of eighteen. And then I also had to build an identity for myself, which was linked to my family trauma because my my real father drowned when I was eight, and my stepfather was extremely brutal just unbelievably brutal. There was, you know, hospital visits and very nasty things that occurred with enough regularity that my brother ended up committing suicide to, from the trauma. And my, my point being is, is that as a child, you don't really have a, a, a knowledge to realize that the way somebody loves you, like your father going off and working really hard, like I was working to love my son, to protect him because I saw my parents fought over money all the time. Everything seemed to be about money, not everything, but it was, it was a main feature. So my reaction to that was I'm going to work as hard as I've got to work to make sure that my kid can have the things that I never got and can have the freedoms I never got and that my wife can have a nice home and and some of these things. But the result of that was, is I didn't spend a lot of time with him, you know, so he developed a lot of resent. But what I try to tell him is I was loving you the best I knew how, and I was trying to protect you from being in the environment that I was in because I saw how money problems can destroy a family. But in his little child heart, he couldn't recognize that. Well, now, uh, just January, him and his girlfriend uh, had a baby. so. I got my first grandchild, but I've watched since he's become a father, how he's now in exactly the mode that his dad was in and is only now for the first time at 41 able to really get it. Yeah. But the point I'm driving at is 
it seems that if if we understood love models and how to see a person's love, because our innate self-perception is that if someone's not loving us the way we want to be loved, then we're not being loved. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on l- understanding love models as a means of healing so that we know that how somebody is loving us so that we can see that the love's actually there and recognize there is love in our life, but maybe it's not exactly what we were hoping for. Yeah, your your love for your child was the greater love to be able to provide for his mother, for him, so he wouldn't suffer. This is the greater love, but children, they don't see this. They, they you know, it's almost as though there's something inside of us that needs to push against our parents for individuation or growth or development. And, and it's a shame that we lose so much time with our parents until we're in the same boat. And now he at 41, he gets it. You know, as you said, he's a father. He can, he sees how much goes in to having to, um, pr- provide and procure. So yeah, you know, you know, I, I always, I put, I say this again, again in the book. Look, at least do the work inwardly. If you can't heal the, with the relationship with your parents outwardly, uh, you might even consider, I often suggest placing a photo of the parent uh, for the mother over the left shoulder, for the father over the right shoulder. So, you know, a guy broken from his dad might put over his desk on the right shoulder a photo of his father and even visualize that, you know, he's got his father's support, even if they don't have this in real life. Or sometimes for a woman, I might suggest putting a photo over your pillow of your mother um, over your left shoulder and asking her at night, mom, please hold me when I'm sleeping so we can heal this bond. Uh, teach me how to trust your love, how to receive it, how to let it in without, you know, without taking care of you, mom, just receiving. And then to visualize this love coming into our body energetically, even if we can't do it in real life with our parents energetically, to do it with a photo, um, because this can be profound because we need these relationships because they're a template for suffering when they're broken. And the more we allow them, but as we're, as you and I are talking about, as you and I are saying, we waste so much time. You know, people often don't heal with their parents until their parents are 70 or 80. And we've missed all that time in between. And so you're preaching, you're preaching to the choir over here, my friend. Um, you're preaching to the choir. Well, you know, it- yeah, no, I'm I'm not so much trying to preach. I'm just trying to put this on the table to see what your thoughts about it are, really. Heal, heal. heal let's heal our relationship with our parents. Those are my thoughts, plain and simple. And people always ask, what if my parents are terrible? What if they did terrible things? Well, that's when, you know, as I said earlier, we don't throw ourselves in front of a moving train. Sometimes this work must be done in our inner images. And and we've got, but nonetheless, do it inwardly. Look behind your mother. Look behind your father. What happened to them that made that that made their love uh, feel hurtful or volatile? Yeah. I teach my clients and patients a concept that I develop called loving at safe distance. I say if it's dangerous to be in personal contact, try email or text messaging. If Absolutely. that gets too volatile, then go into the sanctity of your heart, hold your intention on that person. And I say, ask your soul to connect you to the soul of your mother or whoever it is and speak to them from your heart as though they were actually there, but don't use judgment language. Use Brilliant. observation and connection and only speak about what's nourishing for both of you. In other words, don't say, okay, mom, you really pissed me off. You screwed my life up. Say, mom, I really miss you and I really love you and I want to be able to love you more and I want to be able to have a personal relationship with you. So keep it in the state that you want to experience or your language is conveying that vibration to that person and you're actually using the power of mind to create more of what you don't want 
So I have to kind of teach them the basics of nonviolent communication so that they know how, because as a shaman, I, I know for a fact that thoughts and words at a distance are still very, very real and they impact that soul, whether you can see it or not, um, for, for, for various reasons that, you know, I'm also clairvoyant so I can watch what things do in the subtle realms. Hi, everybody. You know, people from around the world are constantly asking me where they can find organic foods and supplements that are actually organic, not just some fake impersonation, which is sadly so common in the marketplace today. My most common suggestion is go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, where you can find a wide range of excellent nutritious products made from certified organic source materials. Organifi has superfood drinks that actually taste great, (laughs) unlike most, immune support products, excellent high-quality protein powders, digestive support, joint support, liver support, green juice, hormonal support, and menstrual ease nutrition formulated by a team of female herbologists for women and more. My family and I and a significant number of my clients and friends and students from around the world use and love Organifi products because they're nutritious, taste great, And unlike many products, you actually get what you pay for. Hallelujah. I love Organifi's high values and high quality products, and they're excellent for athletes, children, and the whole family. There's no better investment than investing in your own health and well-being. And when it comes to investing in my health and the health of my family, I go to Organifi. If that's not enough to make you want to explore all the amazing products waiting for you at Organifi, I'd love to sweeten the deal for you by offering you a special Living 4D with Paul Check discount of 20% on any of Organifi's excellent certified organic super clean nutritious products by using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 on checkout. That's CHECK20, all caps, on checkout. I hope you enjoy Organifi as much as my family and I do. I studied Steiner's work for a good 25 years now. And in his teachings, he talks about how whenever we have an imbalance in any of our chakras due to past life traumas or or, uh, karmas that we haven't resolved or relationship challenges that we haven't resolved, that we will keep attracting those circumstances and types of people back to us until we have to face the trauma and heal it. Oh, absolutely. He says we we're and I'm I'm paraphrasing, but he says we we basically magnetically attract what we have to confront and deal with effectively, and I I think that's important because when people try to medicate with drugs and alcohol and and uh, denial or avoidance or uh, y- turning their the, the the person that they have this anger or resent toward into a scarecrow and, and leaving them out in the field, they don't realize it'll show up as your boss, your next lover. You know, you'll keep pulling it in and, until you grow because we we can't fake our own healing and we can't fake our own spiritual growth and that we can't drug it either. You know, we can't, the pain might go away with the alcohol, but it didn't go away. It just got masked. Yeah, very well said. That's exactly right. It, our, our, our broken relationship with our mother will show up as our boss, our relationship to, to healing, our relationship to Western medicine, our relationship with our partner, for sure, our, our best friends. It's, it's always imprinted. Our relationship with our parents is this template. Very well put, Paul. Great. Mark, what are some of the factors used to differentiate attachment trauma from inherited family trauma? And how can we tell if trauma stems from our early life experiences or from our family history? So we need to listen to the trauma language that our client is expressing. Because generational trauma, it has a distinctive quality. Um, And attachment trauma does too. But for example, you can hear the generational overtones in, in a sentence, I'll harm a child. or like Sarah said, I don't deserve to live. Similarly, you can hear the echoes of uh, abandonment trauma coming through words like I'll be rejected and left all alone. And attachment traumas are really quite common, more than I originally, um, as I was a beginning therapist working in the generational realms, 
Um, now I find myself mostly working with attachment. Attachment traumas are quite common. The trauma of being in an incubator or being born to a mother who was deeply stressed or being born after a miscarried or stillborn child or being the child of parents who drink or cheat or hurt each other or don't have enough money or separate early or travel when the child is too young. All this can profoundly affect us. So, you know, this is what I spend a good part of my time teaching in my training. And my training is teaching therapists how to listen for this, what I call core language, this trauma language, how to follow it, uh, how to let it guide them. Uh, and, in, and in my book, I teach the readers how to become detectives of their own trauma language. Right. Since reading your book, I've looked into various research papers and interviews with various experts speaking on the issues of inherited family trauma and genetic inheritance in general. In your book, you state that we are strongly influenced by the most recent three generations of our ancestry, but I've also found researchers saying that it may go back as far as 14 generations, and that's people doing research on the DNA and ancestral histories. So some of my questions in this regard are, what do you feel the mechanism of transfer is between the deceased and the living? The DNA itself is a physical structure in vivo, in vivo. So my question is, is the DNA functioning like an antenna system to pick up energy and information from those that have a genetic influence on us? I've got more questions, but I won't overload you. So let's start with that. Yeah, exactly. Ba basically, our, our sperm and egg cells carry memories of trauma. That's to put it simply. And then this information lives somewhere in our bodies and gets passed forward to the, to the next generation, making sure the next generation gets the message to keep them safe from what we experience. So our kids are born with altered brains because of the experiences we had or our parents had. And then our kids can live anxious or depressed and they can carry our feelings of grief and hopelessness, our shutdown, our depression, never realizing that they're carrying our trauma response from something that happened to us, from an event that is you know, I, I look at it this way, that it's chemically imprinted, the DNA of the whole family. Um, and then these events, the, these traumas, they then have a limiting effect on parenting, blocking the flow of love that a mother is able to give her child, creating these attachment traumas that we just spoke about um, in the children of future generations. Getting back to that idea of 14 generations, absolutely, they're doing studies right now it, there were specifically worms where they could see, they could trace this generational influence for 14 generations. We can only see it for two generations in humans because you have, a, it takes 12 to 20 years in a generation of humans. Um, so we study mice because mice and humans have a similar genetic makeup. Over 90% of the genes in humans have counterparts with mice um, in, in the genes in mice. And over 80% of those genes are identical. So that's why we study mice and rats. Plus, you can get a generation of mice in 12 to 20 weeks, where, whereas it takes 12 to 20 years in humans. So now we can show a, by looking at mice, we can show up to four generations. Um, before, when I wrote the book in 2016, we were talking three. In 2018, it came out. Um, just by looking at the pattern in rodents, we can see four generations in m mice and rats, 14 generations in worms. So at least, it, you know, there's a lot to speculate here. Th this is new science. We're in the beginning. Um, I'm sure that they're going to turn up, um, perhaps even connection to, uh, uh to past lives. <laughs> they know that we're going to see some DA DNA. But but you asked me about epigenetic mechanisms. So some of the mechanisms observed now, um, we're looking at DNA methylation, in which a, a one is a, a methyl residue is added onto the DNA. We look at histone modifications, which are added onto the proteins. We're looking at abnormal levels of small non-coding RNA molecules, microRNAs, which, you know, when we look at the mice studies, these are found in the blood, the brain, and the sperm. Of, of mice and in humans. So recently there was a Tufts University study that looked at um, 
fathers being able to pass anxiety onto their children through their sperm. And this connected the same non-coding RNA molecules that they found in mice. They've now found in humans. And recently I looked at a, another mechanism of transmission called long RNAs can also transmit the effects of early life trauma um, and affect subsequent generations. And then I think about a year or two ago, I was reading about intercellular communication. Particles are ejected from cells, releasing little packages known as uh, extracellular vesicles, creating a form of long distance communication between cells. And there's protein folding. We keep uncovering more epigenetic mechanisms. Yeah, I've got a, a, a few concepts to to put in front of you here. Where do you feel the information being transferred to the living from the deceased is stored? And is it your in your and is it in your opinion real time dynamic information? For example, a soul still self conscious and active in the afterlife, or is it being retrieved from something of a mind or a field like Rupert Sheldrake describes as a morphogenic field concept? You know, uh, th there's definitely a field of knowledge, uh, you know, like Rupert Sheldrake talks about that we, that we tap into. And it's a field that contains information from the past, information that tends to repeat, patterns that play out largely in the form of suffering. In other words, unconsciously, We'll, we'll suffer similarly to those who've suffered before us. We'll, we'll give voice to their experience by, by repeating it, often at the same age they experienced it. And I describe this phenomenon as unconscious loyalty to someone in our family. You know, let's say our father, he leaves um, his first partner, and then we unconsciously leave our first partner without connecting it um, to his experience. Or our mother, she gives away her first child and we abort our first child and we're not thinking we're connected. It's in this field of knowledge. Or even, you know, we, our mother was poorly treated in her relationship and we're poorly treated in ours. Or our mom or dad struggled with a chronic illness and we carry a, or we develop a chronic illness. And at the same time, you know, we don't even have to go any further than molecular biology, because many of these DNA expressions, they're carried in our cells. You know, as we talked about the blood, the brain, the sperm, uh, you know, as we looked at these mice studies, um, and, you know, there's, oh, I, there's one in my book I just love, but it really nails it. Um, there's this one particular study done at Emory Medical School in Atlanta, where male mice were made to fear a cherry blossom-like scent. And the researchers um, shocked the mice whenever they smelled the scent. And they found molecular changes in the blood, in the brain, in the sperm. Right there in that first generation, um, the brains contained enlarged areas with a greater amount of smell receptors so that the mice could detect this scent at lesser concentrations uh, protecting themselves. Amazingly, their brains had epigenetically adapted to protect them. And the researchers, they had this cool idea. What if we take the sperm and we inject it, we impregnate female mice who were not shocked? And then the astonishing thing is what happened in the second and third generation. The, the pups and the grandpups became jumpy and jittery just by smelling the scent. They had inherited the stress response without directly experiencing the trauma. It seems like we're about to become very untrusting of large corporations and science that's used as propaganda <laughs> uh, <laughs> for the same reasons. Uh, uh. Did you ever happen to see Rupert Sheldrake's study? Uh, I saw a documentary of his work, and, and it actually showed the researchers doing the study where they took a group of magpies and they, they had them caged. And what they did was they had one somebody dressed up in like a scary suit with a scary face, and he would come inside the cage, and he would 
bang uh, like a garbage can lid and act real crazy and scare the birds and run after them. And then what they did is they took the eggs that had been laid by those birds after doing this repeatedly to them over a period of time. They separated them once they hatched. And then what they did is they raised them and put them in the cage. And then they monitored how the birds reacted to the same exact stressor. And they found that they'd already developed coping mechanisms in one generation. Makes complete sense. What Sheldrake was showing is that based on genes, the information isn't likely to transfer that quickly. So there must be a field of information that the genes of the offspring are tapping into. No, there's no doubt about that. No doubt, because we repeat stories and experiences of our parents and grandparents after we're born. So, for example, our dad, our dad fails at age 40, and we're already born, so it's not a question of DNA. And all of a sudden, we hit 39, 40, 41, and we start making bad business decisions and failing uh, in, in a similar way connected to this, but how can we explain it with genes? We can't. So there is a field, you know, what, what I call unconscious loyalty, an unconscious way of suffering. So our parents, it's almost as though, dad, that you shouldn't suffer alone because of this unconscious loyalty, even though I don't even like you. you know, so there's this unconscious loyalty that I will suffer similarly. In fact, I find that the more we reject that parent, the more we don't like that parent, the more likely we are to repeat their negative experiences. Yes, absolutely. There's a field of knowledge that we connect. So when you were throwing all these ideas at me, I'd say the most, the one I connect with most is Rupert Sheldrake's. This idea of the knowing field, the morphogenic field. Yes, and the reason I'm bringing this up is is very specific, and that is we're in a very materialist, scientific materialist culture where there's heavy, heavy emphasis on the DNA as the cause of everything. But there is a simple scientific fact that if anybody is aware of, makes you have to question this. And this fact is very simple. Matter cannot organize itself. That is a hardcore fact. You can stand next to a pile of rocks for a trillion years and it will not make a watch out of itself. There has to be an organizing field of information. Einstein himself said the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. In other words, if there's not a field of energy and information to guide material substance, it does not appear or move or act. So because I keep seeing all this literature over and over again, and so many doctors are gene fanatics now, I have to say to them, you're talking about the end product of an informative force or field, and to make it a physical reality without addressing the formative force is to see half the picture at best. So that leads to my next question, which is what is your conception of a soul and how does the soul in your conception play into the issues of inherited family trauma? In that sense, I would say that we're part of a family soul and that we carry forward what's unresolved from previous generations in this field, in this morphogenic field, in this field of knowing. You know, Jung talked about this a hundred years ago when he said he felt there was an impersonal karma within a family which passes on from parents to children. And he described how he felt that he had to complete or continue things which the previous generation had left unfinished. I mean, it, it's, it's what we're discussing here, this idea of this field that even after we're born, even it's not a question of gene transfer. It's not a question of epigenetics. It's still um, uh, stepping into this field that informs um, the whole, um, you know, they even see, we even see this, uh, where car wrecks happen at a similar place in the road, um, at the same, um, at the exact same place. How can that happen? You know, there's this, obviously these, these fields, these knowing fields that exist, no doubt. Yeah, I, I actually, 
drove by a place once where there was six or eight crosses on the same corner from families that had left a cross and flowers or ornaments to to commemorate the death of the person that died there and i've so i've seen how these forces accumulate you know jung made a very potent statement in regard to what you just said he said all children are tasked with the unfinished business of their parents lives yes yes hi everybody i'm sure you've all heard of the benefits of bone broth but i bet you don't know about bone broth protein powder I found an awesome bone broth protein powder with Paleo Valley, and I asked Autumn Smith if she'd explain why hers is so good from Paleo Valley. Well, like you said, collagen is basically the fountain of youth, and most of us are not getting enough of it in our diet because maybe we don't have time to simmer bones on a regular basis. And so we created our powder to make getting the benefits of collagen for your joint health, for your gut health, for your mental health, really, really simple. And we sourced it from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished bones. So it is a beef bone broth protein powder that you can literally put in everything. It's tasteless. I add it to my son's smoothies. I put it into his desserts. You can even put it in soup and get all the benefits of collagen without all of the time and energy and investment. So all you have to do to check it out is go to our website at paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15. That's lowercase C-H-E-K-15 at checkout. And I hope your family loves it. I know you'll love it. Keep your body healthy. Keep your kids healthy. And let's make the world a better place with Paleo Valley. Enjoy. One of the things that, that I haven't drawn out of you yet, so I'm going to squeeze you a little. Uh, what, what is your conception of a soul? A big question, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, you know, when I work with people, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not in that conversation with myself. I'm more in the conversation of what I'm feeling. And I'm feeling fragmentations. So I'm working with where we've split off, cut off, dissociated, numbed out not to feel something. And when I see my, feel myself working with people, it's I'm working to integrate what's been fragmented. So I, um, work with my intuition, my visual sense, my felt senses. I also, of course, use what I talk about in the book, my trauma language. So I've got, I'm listening, I'm hearing their, their verbal trauma language, but I'm also hearing their nonverbal trauma language, which are the anxieties that rise after a certain event or um, their uh, the, their, their traumas that repeat at a certain age, similar to an age that somebody in the family experienced something. So then when I'm in there with my hands dirty and my shoes off and my feet in the ground, I'm working somatically where we have numbed ourselves, where in the body. Now, all of this, of course, um, is going to be, be some sort of answer about the soul, um, indirectly. But where we've shut off consciousness, where consciousness doesn't live. So, for example, um, I know that when I work with this man or this woman who's tightened and the shoulders are coming forward to guard the heart and there's a numbness experience at the heart, I know that that person is experiencing less circulation, less oxygen, oxygen. Uh, less hemoglobin isn't carrying enough oxygen, less glucose, less, literally, less consciousness. Less consciousness lives in this area. And I know this is a doorway where I can enter. So when I enter this doorway, um, I know the idea is to bring more aliveness, more life force, more vitality back to this area through integration. So we're working with what, um, what, stopped life force, and then how we can integrate um, what's been numbed or tightened. And then in this way, after I do this work with people, and I see feel the life force flowing again, um, I step back, Paul, 
I, I don't continue. There comes a place where after the intervention, and I might give, I do give homework, obviously, but I'll step back and I'll wait for this something greater to integrate this something greater, whatever it is, let's call it soul. But I wait for this, their soul to then take over and, and integrate this piece of work that we've done. And I'm careful not to stay in there. I'm careful to with, withdraw, to step back and turn it over to the great soul for their healing to continue. And there I don't interfere. There I don't interfere. Yeah, that's really beautiful. So, you know, I think I, 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 this leads me to ask you a question. You know, being as empathic and connected to people as you are, you must feel that there's more to a body than just the physical stuff. Do you experience a presence around a body and a shift in that presence through your work? Absolutely. So, absolutely. So, I, um, that's what I, I call I, a soul. Yeah, I began my work in those realms. Many, many years ago, I was an energy healer. I was uh, taking people on shamanic journeys. I did past life work with people for about 10 years. Um, wow. Taking people to the state between lives and doing this type of um, discarnate work. And along the way, um, y- you know, and I-, I have to say, once I got wind to this other field, this this inherited trauma field, this generational field that was also informing us. I packed all my bags and went over there um, only because, um, and, and remember, there was no science when I started working in this field 30 years ago. The science is within 15 years. So 30 years ago, here I am working in this, this other realm called inherited trauma, but there was no science to back it up. Nothing. I had a couple ideas of Carl Jung saying that he knew a hundred years ago that there was this um, impersonal karma like we talked about. But I knew it was the truth. Now, when you ask me this question, is there something around, um, are we sitting inside this greater soul? Absolutely. Is there something informing us that's, that's running the show behind us? No doubt, no question. I just don't know all I know is I've not, I, I've not, I don't analyze. I work like a somatic therapist within. I jump, I step into that field, I intuit, I work, and then I step out and I let that greater force impact um, what was, what we just, what, what just got created. Yeah, I think that's beautiful and I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm giving you a, a, an answer or not. All I can say is yes, yes and yes. And then well, I think I think what you're giving us is your own inner experience. I mean, I can't expect any more than that from somebody, right? Now, somebody might call that spirit, someone might call it soul, someone might say it's the epiphenomenon of the brain or the biochemistry of the body. But I think you and I both know that what we're talking about isn't there when the body dies. Right. Right? Right. The, the something greater that you turn it over to isn't there in a dead body. And to me, that's called soul. Oh, okay. Well, in that sense, yes, absolutely. You know, I'm in contact with the souls of those who've passed that, that I've been close to. Um, meaning, meaning, I feel, talk, hear, connect with, and... Uh, there's been many evidential things that have taken place that have transpired between these energies, these these loved ones. Um, in fact, a large part that informed my work was my sister when she passed away young. In fact, I would say she was 39, I was 40, uh, 42, and I would meet with her and, uh, it, it, after she passed. One time I asked her to show me, um, I'm going to sound a little out there, Paul, but uh, one time I asked her to show me. No, you're, 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 you're on this podcast, you're going to sound normal. <laughs> <laughs> I asked her to show me where she was, what was happening. And she said, believe me, you can't, I can't show you. Your body couldn't take it. And I said, no, 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 come on. Let me 
take me, take me, take me. I was in a deep meditation. And in that moment, Paul, and I know I'm going to sound pretty out there, um, she showed me an experience where the light was so bright, I thought I was going to go crazy. The sounds were so rich. I thought I, it was as though there were a million sounds at once. Um, And in that moment, I popped out and jumped out of the meditation. And I'm like, whoa, it it blew my circuits. But, you know, this sister is very much in relationship with me. I always feel her in the background with me when I work. So, you know, again, although I can't give an answer of what the soul is, um, if you ask me, um, I can give you a felt sense of my experience, what it is. This is the best I can, the best I can do. I think that's beautiful. And, 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 you know, I think science is objectively oriented, but it has completely disconnected itself from the subjective. And what I say to scientists that have this sort of, if I can't wait and measure it, it's not real. I say, I have a question for you. Is love important in your life? And every one of them says yes. And I say, well, just remember, you can't weigh and measure it. But without it, none of the things that you weigh and measure would matter. Point being is what we're calling soul is that experience of connection. It is that experience of knowing. It is that experience of feeling. And it is an experience that cannot be objectified and put into a nice little package. Here it is, because that's a scientific materialist concept. And that's the wrong end of the subject object matter relationship to try to define a soul. So for me, what you're expressing is a subjective expression of a subjective reality. And I think that's the most honest we could ever be. If I had to put words to it, it's, it's, we are guided by our soul and I don't, and I don't know more, any more than that, other than there's this, there's this force, um, that guides when I get quiet, that and I, then I live in accordance with it. Instead of discord, I'm living in accordance when I get quiet enough to allow myself to be guided by this force. That's beautiful. How do you differentiate inherited family trauma making its influence via the subject's DNA versus being possessed by another disembodied soul or intelligence? I don't know if you work in that realm, but because I've worked with many, many cases of possession and the behaviors can be very similar to uh, attachment syndrome behaviors. It can be similar to um, very similar to inherited family trauma type behaviors. And if you, if you don't have a way to differentiate, you might not realize that you're dealing with something other than what you think it is. I'm just curious if you have a, a, an answer for a question like that. You know, my, uh, which answer do you want? My stock answer is we live in a multidimensional <laughs> reality. And there's some yes, things, that's a good one. And some things <laughs> science cannot explain. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and then my other answer is we're very much affected by discarnate energies. Um, and e- even though that's no longer my field of study, I spent many years prior um, working with these energies of um, that ha- that can have a great influence. I remember w- I was trained by a, a, a man many years ago named Roger Wooger. And Roger wrote a- Oh, I studied his work. I used oh. his techniques. Oh, good. Yeah, well, I studied with Roger as well. And Roger was a great teacher. And we would have- That's amazing. And R- Roger and I would have this argument. Um, I'd say, Roger, you know, not everything is past lives. There's, there's a lot of times that uh, this lives in a family history. It also um, lives, it also, we're being influenced by discarnate energies that resonate with our trauma because their own trauma has kept them stuck in a sense. And, you know, sort of like Swiss cheese, they're pulled us. So Roger and I would, you know, have great conversations about, which continues this question of what is the soul, but um, we'd have great conversations about what would be past life? What would be um, a part of the collective unconscious? What would be influences of discarnate, discarnate energies? And where I packed my bags and the, and the terrain I, I, I traveled to, which was um, what would be 
family influences. And to, and to tell you, Paul, I once I started living over there in family influences, it was such a large, rich, dynamic field that I set up camp, built my house, and, and I've been teaching about the effects of inherited and family trauma for over 30 years. Um, because this, for me, is so rich, but it does not negate or deny the other realities. Going back to my stock answer, we live in a multidimensional reality. But it's beautiful and it's true. And, uh, you know, years and years ago, I hired a past life regressionist because a lot of things were happening in my life and had been happening. Uh, just as a quick example, I would have a patient come in with some crazy, weird problem that nobody could figure out. And I would feel a presence in me. And all of a sudden, I would know. It was as though I knew what was wrong. And I would know exactly what questions to ask. Or I would know there would be times I was doing healing ceremonies and my soul, my inner self would guide me to using a tool in a way that I've never used it before, but somehow I knew what to do. Exactly. You, it's that sentence we talked about earlier. You get quiet and get in accordance with how you're guided by this force, by our soul. Absolutely. So what happened was I said, okay, I've got to find out more about my past lives because there's something inside of me that's working when it needs to be here to help somebody but I'm not consciously aware of it. So I hired a regressionist and a lot of neat stuff came out of it. And I thought, okay, I need to learn how to do past life regression. So I started searching and reading books and I came across Roger Wolger's work, studied it and started applying his techniques. And I've had countless people that I've done past life regression work on that had all sorts of chronic problems that cleared up through doing the regression work. So when you mentioned Roger Wolger, I was like, wow, that's amazing because both of us have a common tie into that dimension through that one man. And so I, I just think that's just yeah, an amazing it's beautiful. Ro thing. Roger was brilliant. And, and um, you know, I love the way he would connect classical music and poetry um, into, his, uh, into his teachings. And um, yeah, I learned a, a lot working with Roger. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, we do have that common thread, Paul. That's great. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wait, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combine them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy Bioptimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it and what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. Mark, in your book, It Didn't Start With You, in Chapter 3, The Family Mind, you speak of influences on the developing fetus in the womb as well as parenting influences. I'd love it if you can give us an overview of the mechanisms by which the neonatal environment is influenced and what the different sources of influence are. Okay. So uh, epigenetics is just one piece of the puzzle, as we've been talking about. You know, embryologists have known for a hundred years that when grandma is five months pregnant with our mother, the egg that will one day become us is already present in our mother's womb inside our grandmother's womb. 
So we know, so that, that just, just stating that fact that embryologists know, there's this field, again, we share three generations of a biological environment, our grandmother, our mother, us. So grandmother's feelings, if you combine that with the work of Bruce Lipton, now you've got mother's emotions are chemically communicated to the fetus through the placenta, which can biochemically alter genetic expression. And so now you build into that. And because of that, now we've got to look into um, uh, perinatal, prenatal, postnatal events. You know, what we call the first gestation. I think um, uh, Gabor Mate coins the phrase the second gestation. Uh, the first nine months out of the womb being essential time for neural development, just as the first nine months within the womb are are, are potent for this period, where, where we're pruning neurons um, based on uh, our caregiving environment, what will give us advantages for creating safety and security. So, you know, when we're talking about influences or or events that affect us in utero, We've got to look at a gazillion things. Did a baby die before us? Was, was this baby miscarried or stillborn? Uh, was our mother not going to keep us? And communicated um, in our inner experience of our mother's thoughts are, I can't keep you. I can't keep you. Or our parents are fighting. We've got to look at that. Are they drinking? Are they cheating? Are they separating? Was dad an alcoholic? Was mom not feeling supported? Um, did she not love our father? Did she feel trapped in the marriage? Was she worried about not having enough money? Uh, was there issues with where they lived, shelter, food? Did one of her parents or siblings or her best friend died while we were in her womb? Was war going on at the time? Um, all this translates into cortisol that can have a caustic effect on us in utero. In fact, I even talk about this in the book where the baby develops a cortisol busting enzyme to deal with mother's stress, to, to deal with mother's stress. Um, and then we've got to look at events during birth and labor and delivery and infancy and childhood. I mean, just so many things to look at. Did her body, how did her body do with the pregnancy? Did she begin to spot? Did she begin to eject the pregnancy? Was the labor long? Was the delivery difficult? Were we put it in, in an incubator where we put it for adoption, where there are forceps. Was there a force separation because she was hospitalized? Were we hospitalized? Did, did mom and dad take a vacation too early? Did we have to go back and forth to mom or dad's because they were separated? Were we sent to grandma's for um, a week because mom needed a break? All of these things. Or, or even going back generations. Yeah, it's amazing how complex it is. It's so complex. It's very complex. Uh, e even going back generationally. I was just going to say it. It's a. It, it, what I love about it is that even though it's complex, you know, you you and I share something, and that is that when you have a situation that's more complex than we can actually gather the data on objectively. Then you have to go into that space that I call connecting to the other person's soul to let it guide us because the intelligence of what's living in each of us knows what it needs to balance itself. And I believe we attract the therapists and the people into our lives that can actually help us if we allow ourselves to be led. And I think, I think. You know, I, I have an intuitive sense that your first many years doing past life recoveries and working with discarnate energies and things gave you the awareness of what you were going to need in order to handle cases with the complexity that were beyond the rational faculty. No doubt. No doubt. So uh, when I go back and I revisit that time in my life, um, I see this as a, I see this whole field as a matrix. So if we have a past life wound, let's say, or um, that similar wound will be in the birth canal, the birth experience, the schoolyard experience, the childhood experience, it's almost as though there's this massive matrix and it doesn't matter which doorway we enter it. So we could enter it through past lives. 
We could enter it through looking at possession or attachment, spirit attachment in that sense. We could look at it working with attachment with our mother. We could work on it uh, with looking at schoolyard wounds and childhood wounds. Um, it almost doesn't matter where. So yes, in that sense, it was a very rich period working with a lot of complex issues, but I find those same issues are experienced in our family history. So yeah, I, I so for me, now I don't That's beautiful. Have, now I don't have to go any further than looking at the landscape of family history and early trauma and attachment trauma. And if I did, and if I went further, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I'd find it there too. I think that's your, that's your gift to the world though. I mean, we, we have to, in order for us to bring something to the world, we have to be able to put it into a package that the world can receive it. And I think your soul has guided you to creating a package for us that only you could create and, and be the vessel for, but it took those experiences to get you to know where your focus needed to be because your inner guidance system said, this is where you set your tent up. Paul, you know, it's funny you bring that up. I knew early on that I wanted to, I wanted to bring this work to the medical community, to the scientific community, to the psychiatric community. And so I made sure when I wrote my book um, not to mention um, things that sit, sit outside the realm of possibility in their experience. So I wrote the book. I stayed very close to the science, and I did that for reasons. And I, I you know, I don't even mention the word family constellation even once in the book. Um, I stayed. Yeah, I noticed that. I stayed close to the science for a reason. I wanted this book. Um, so it ended up winning the, the best award in psychology, the Nautilus Award. Um, and the reason it did so, I believe, is because I didn't stray off the path. Scientists, physician, or spiritualists could pick up this book equally and find himself or herself in it. In it. Yes, that's great. You know, you asked me, you asked me earlier, and, and I want, I kind of want to go back to this idea. You asked me earlier, what about hypnosis and past life regression? And I didn't answer it, but, but I, I feel like I want to dip in there for a minute. Yeah. Uh, you know, I skipped past that. That's Where okay. was that? That's oh yeah, right. there it is. That's all right. I, you asked it to me. There. You did. You asked it to me and I sort of skipped over it. And, and there was a reason, but, but I want to tell you, um, now that we're getting closer, <laughs> I want to tell you, um, for me, I find what's the most effective induction is following trauma language. So I've discovered that when a trauma happens, clues are left behind. And these clues are in the form of emotionally charged words or sentences that form, they form a bread, breadcrumb trail, Paul. So when you learn how to follow this breadcrumb trail, it's like finding the missing piece of the puzzle that lets the whole picture come into view and finally explains, gives us that context to explain why, why we feel the way we feel. So I just want to do this for the listener. I, I want to take the listener here. When I work with somebody, when I'm working with somebody, the first thing I do is I'm listening to trauma language. And as I've been saying throughout this podcast, it can be both verbal and nonverbal. When it's verbal, it lives in the words we use to describe our, issue, our issues, our deepest fears, our anxieties, our most difficult relationships. Um, when that trauma language is nonverbal, it lives in our behaviors and in our symptoms, in our destructive behaviors that mimic certain traumatic situations in our family history, um, uh, the unusual symptoms that appear after we experience an unsettling event, or uh, the fears and anxieties, I've said this before, that strike suddenly when we reach a certain age, often it's the same age that something happened in our family history. But this nonverbal trauma language, Paul, it's also mirrored in our relationship struggles, the types of partners we choose, how we allow ourselves to be treated, how we treat others. 
It also lives in the way we deal with money, success. All of this is a breadcrumb trail. So it doesn't matter what door I open. If you say, hey, Mark, I want to work with money, that's the door. If you want to say, Mark, I want to work with um, uh, my relationship, why I choose partners who A, B, and C, it's right there. So I'm following nonverbal. Like, let's go back to Sarah. Her verbal trauma language is, I don't deserve to live. Her nonverbal trauma language is, I'm, I'm going to bleed to death. I cut myself so deeply, I'm, I almost bleed to death. So that was the leader. That, so all, even the question of the soul, that's the soul. The soul guided me by her telling me, I don't deserve to live. There was the soul. And, and the next thing, her cutting guided me by why is she cutting and almost bleeding to death? That's, gui- that's the force behind the force, guiding the behavior and, and, and pulling me into the sphere so I can sit with her. So I, I just wanted to, to just tell this because I feel that the, the therapist, the, the role of the therapist, the job of the therapist is to gather this language, both verbal and nonverbal, the pieces of the puzzle, the story fragments, and to link it together. To connect the dot, to connect the dots for the client, because the client can't do it. They're in the midst of a a, a scattered trauma. So basically, the ther- the therapist becomes the family hippocampus, that part of the brain that became compromised in trauma. Hey, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, that holds the larger consciousness together. Because we can't do it, we're in a trauma pattern. So I teach my students to become to become the client's hippocampus, the family hippocampus, and gather the pieces and help the client. So there's three things I teach my students to do. We bring together what has been lost or separated. That's number one. So uh, our father was rejected. He's been separated. So we have to bring him back together. Or we have to bring together the child we aborted. Or we have to bring together our uncle that nobody likes because he was a, 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 a murderer. Or our grandfather who cheated on our grandmother. We have to bring together who's been excluded. The second thing I teach my students to do is to separate out what doesn't belong to us, which are behaviors and feelings that aren't ours, which aren't ours. Like when Sarah said, I deserve to die, that wasn't hers. When Sarah almost bled to death, that isn't hers. We have to separate that out. And the third thing I do, I teach my students to do, and I said this earlier, Paul, um, uh, we need to integrate what's been fragmented. We need to integrate those parts that have gone AWOL, man, those parts that are offline. And we need to bring them back to, and I'm going to use the word soul because I guess we're all friends here. (laughs) We need to bring them back. Yeah. (laughs) We need that common denominator. (laughs) Yeah. We need to bring those parts that are lifeless back to life. I love it. You know, I teach my students isolate and then integrate. Yes. Isolate where the trauma is, where the fragment is, what's not working, and then reactivate it and integrate it into the system so that it can become whole again, which is a, a very similar concept. One of the things that came to my mind listening to you speaking of the trauma language was Jung's word association tests and how he was able to figure out which words they had a delayed reaction to. And that showed him the door in to where the trauma was at. Brilliant. Are you familiar with his word I, association? I'm not familiar with that. And, and it's brilliant. It's exactly right. You know what, 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 what he did? He, would, he, chose a, he made a long list of words that he knew like mother, father, sex, money. And, and so he would use a stopwatch. Now, the patient didn't know what he was doing but he would say to them read the the word i'm going to re- give you a word and i want you to respond to it with whatever comes up so if i said to you mark uh pink what comes to your mind right right brilliant right well for me the music the music of big pink the band <laughs> the band the band the band album okay so if i said hot yeah you would have a response So he used a stopwatch and he found that if a person had a trauma, it triggered a delayed response to the word. And some of them would just go into sort of a glassed over, like a derealized state. 
And so he was able to use word association Brilliant. to find the doorway. To That's their the trauma. doorway. Brilliant. Yeah. And when I studied your book, I thought, ah, oh, I wonder if he studied Jung's word association because the trauma language is really a very similar approach because you're able to pick up the doorway. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you bring that up because we know from trauma theory, when a traumatic event happens, significant information bypasses the frontal lobes. So the experience of exactly what happens in a trauma, it can't be named or ordered through words because our language centers are compromised. And without, langu and without language, our experiences are stored as fragments, fragments of memory, fragments of body sensation, fragments of images, fragments of language, of course, fragments of emotion. It's like the mind it, it, it disperses and these essential elements get separated. We lose the story and never complete the healing. Yet what we're talking about here, like Jung's association test and what you and I are doing, these pieces aren't lost. They've merely been rerouted and they resurface. For me, for him, they re resurface in, the, in the, the lapse in time, the days experience the client will feel toward that word. For me, they resurface in verbal and nonverbal trauma language, which is what I follow. Yes. Excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by all this. I'm really glad that we got to talk about these things. Um, can you explain the reasons for identifying a client's greatest fear and core complaint with regard to, regard to resolving the family trauma? Now, I completely understand this, but I think this is something the listeners really need to understand. So why the greatest fear and um, the core complaint? for your investigation. Yeah, okay, so it's it's exactly what I'm talking about here. The core sentence to me which is the greatest fear. We learned that in the book. What's your core sentence? What's your greatest fear? Um is for me the gold nugget of trauma language. And the core complaint is how we describe our issue. And I give 12 questions in the book. What happened right before you feel this way? What was going on at that time? What's it like in its worst moments? All those questions. And this language, this is how we unearth what's been fragmented. Because remember, just like I just said, all this significant information has bypassed the frontal lobes and it's scattered within us. And now it's resubmerged and it's gone into what we call what we've been talking about fragmentations. So we've got these fragments of feelings, these parts of the body that are numb, these fragments of images, and this language, by having somebody say, let's say a core sentence like um, Sarah's, like, I'll, I don't deserve to live, or I'm a terrible person, or I've done something terrible. If I say to you, um, Susan, say those words, I've done something terrible. Now, all of a sudden, she goes into the body's having a deep response that the tightening in other words the trauma response is forming and hence here's the doorway so once we've isolated the trauma language now we can track it back to the originating event into childhood or the family history and then we're ready to do the deep work to heal she just gave us the doorway i said sarah say your worst fear say your core sentence uh, um, and, and then all of a sudden boom the doorway opens and we're in. That's great. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Sherveen Jaffariah, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their Biocharge Activated Coconut Charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their Organic Longevity Formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis Liposomal Glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. 
when you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. How much of our core language and core sentence do you feel are working through sympathetic resonance? And to elaborate, uh, since the entire universe can be uh, said to be composed of energy and information, um, that is an expression of pure potential, it seems logical and likely that our thoughts and words function akin to cymatics in, in that we manifest or inform what we put vibration to. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm just curious, is, is that core sentence causing a sympathetic resonance that's bringing the trauma experience back into uh, in, in vivo, really? It, 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 that, that's why I designed it. That's exactly what it's doing. This is a great question because years have gone, years of my work have gone into designing um, the healing sentences, which come from the core sentences. Really, they're the flip. They're the opposite, in a sense, of the core sentences. And I teach this in my book. So just as core sentences, which is the worst fear, can bring forward the traumatic resonance in our body, healing sentences can do the opposite. They can help downregulate. They can help downregulate our limbic system by creating feeling states of, of feeling supported, of feeling calm, feeling states that feed the prefrontal cortex. So the right sound or the right sentence, and, and again, I'm a big believer in this language has to be precise, can help us calm the stress response so as a chance to settle. For example, um, we might say, let's say I've had a, a break in the attachment and I fragmented my, you know, the soul, the soul parts have scattered and, um, we might land on a healing sentence that integrates those young fragmented parts of ourselves, a sentence like, uh, you know, I might put a hand here in my chest and another hand here down on my uh, belly. And I might say to myself, Mark, I, I've got you. I'll, I'll breathe with you until you feel safe. I'll breathe with you until we integrate in our body, until we can feel pulsing, until we can feel pulsing throughout our core. And a sentence like this can, can work wonders. So again, a lot of precision goes into these healing sentences. I've spent 30 years changing a word here, changing a word there to get, you know, I list these several of these healing sentences in my book um, so that we can say these sentences and have this um, uh, somatic experience. Um, and often when I'm working with people, I'll inject sound healing. So, for example, I'll notice yes, when I'm too. working with somebody. Ah, great, brilliant. Right? Who, of course, all of course, if we have that same beginning through Roger, and we've have all these connections. Of course, we're doing very similar things. Um, but you know, I'll be working yeah, with lovely. somebody, and and I'll feel um, okay. The throat's not moving. I'm going to make a sound for the throat, or I'm going to make a sound that rattles the rib cage, or I'm going to make a sound that that brings life force back into the pelvic floor. And I make these sounds and I tell people, look, I'm going to make a sound. If you don't like it, let me know. But if you can either make it with me or use it to come back into that area to get life force. So I do that just about in all my healing work with people. Yeah. That's amazing. One technique that I use, and I don't know where I learned it or if I learned it or if it came to me, and I, because I do a lot of this work on myself, I do everything that I teach anyone else to do on myself long Me enough to too. see how it really works. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't feel I don't feel like I'm fulfilling my responsibility as a teacher or or a therapist. I have to absolutely always. I never in plant medicine ceremonies take anyone on any kind of a journey that I haven't done many times because I need to know exactly what the they're, they're going to experience. You know, but. A simple technique that I, I found is that certain days I would, for for quite a number of years in the sauna, I would just go through the tone scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. And, and I would find that depending on what stresses I had, I couldn't pronounce certain of the tone scales. It would, my voice wouldn't do it. 
So then what I found is I went to the one that worked the easiest for me. So maybe fa. And I just stuck with that. It would harmonize me. Then I could go back, say the second chakra, the, uh, Ray, and all of a sudden it would start opening up. And so then I would go to the next one and I would keep working with the ones that were working to bring me into harmonic resonance. And I found it opened the doorways for the blocked energies. Brilliant. Uh, my, my next question is how much inherited family trauma do you feel would clear up if we were more conscious of how we use the power of word or vibration? In other words, well, well, again, you know, this is this is exactly what we're both saying, that that there's a resonance with healing language, healing sentences, healing sounds. Um, and I've, I've, it's a large part of the work. So when someone works with me, we might go through uh, this, maybe spend an hour, uh, the first hour. I do two hour sessions, the first hour. Um, diagnostic work, education, that sort of thing. And the second hour is all eyes, eyes closed. And that's where we're Beautiful. through, through the, through the client's experience. That's where I'm hearing and where we're, we're landing on that precise healing language that they need to say. For example, um, I gave an example earlier of I've got you, I'll, I'll, I'll breathe with you until you feel safe, but maybe for the, child who wasn't held or wasn't heard um we might i might say a sentence like i'll breathe with you until you feel held seen and safe or you know a sentence um until we come together in our body or you know uh uh oh gosh there's so i mean it could be anything but it's all tailored to the person's experience and then not only or am I doing it in the experience with them? But now they have this as homework six times a day, 60 seconds. They've got, they, for 60 seconds, six times a day, so we can change the brain, so we can affect the amygdala. Um, we're replaying or recapturing that feeling state where we're integrated. So for someone, it might be vibration, pulsing. For someone else, it might be, uh, waves, currents, um, whatever we, you know, I find that where we're numb and tight, if we can just stay with what's intolerable until we can mine beneath it, what's beneath it is pure consciousness. It's the soul waiting to be, here we are again with the word, the soul waiting to be discovered. Yeah, you or, got or, it too. Yeah. Pure consciousness, right. a whole pure great spirit. We are home. It's just, just waiting to be mined. And so it's it's almost as though we have to teach ourselves to stay with what's intolerable because on the surface we're running away from what's intolerable but as we mine deeply we've struck the mother uh, I don't mean mother we've struck gold we've struck um um the gold which is just pure consciousness and the sensation pop of pure consciousness yeah i think i'll I'll just sort of reframe it what i was sharing with you so i can help you see what I'm trying to say a little differently in my work with people over the many years. I I often get patients that have rejected parts of themselves that hurt. I'll give you a case history. For example, I had a guy that was on the, my treatment table and he said, I fucking hate my back. I want to kill it. I want to cut it out. I hate it. And I said to him, the first thing I need to teach you is to never talk that way because your back is made of living cells that are breathing and to them, you are God. They act out every thought, feeling, and emotion with complete subservience to your mind. I said, whenever you feel the urge to talk like that, I would like you to say, I love my back and it's doing the very best it can do to support me every day. And it is through my love that we are going to heal together. And I said, every time you have the urge to use words that disconnect you from yourself, use it as a trigger to reframe it in something that's dream or life or body or outcome affirmative, because you're using the power of word and vibration, which is the force that manifests everything 
to create more of what you do not want. So what I'm really saying with the question is, if if people in the public knew how powerful voice, word, and the vibration of their own thoughts and their own breath is, and they recognize that they can track their own breaches, imbalances, injustices, and pains by listening to the words they say and converting them to positive affirmation. The real question is how much of what people have to go to therapists for would ultimately resolve because they consciously, with their own intent, reframed it and put themselves in the state of being who and what they choose to be, not the victim. I've always been a believer that if we can stay present and attuned, we are we're already there. And the more work we do to remain to stay in a place of grounded, integrated, um, life force flowing through us, connected to our core, operating from our core, there is no other. There just is our presence. So it's um, really that is the work. And can someone bypass, can bypass all the, um, uh, if someone spends, uh, if someone has a practice that is successful in integrating those parts that had been fragmented to where we're vibrating and, um, uh, living from our inner, um, shine, our inner resonance, our inner glow, um, that is the work. So yeah, I'm in agreement. We That's beautiful. We we wouldn't have to do much else, but we're not designed <laughs> to stay in those places um as much as we'd like. We're very pulled, you know, the negative experiences are like Velcro as we know, and positive experiences are like tef Teflon, as so says um uh um oh my goodness. Um the neuroscientist Rick Hansen. Because of this, because of this, we find ourselves needing to be, make contact with where these our dark places, our shadow places. Um, um, yeah, simply put, I'd That's say that's gorgeous. Yeah, Mark, for those that have your book but feel they need professional help to clear and learn from the issues of inherited family trauma. Is there a listing on your website so people can find people trained by you, or are you the only clinic dealing with these issues professionally? No, I have a lot of, a lot of people trained by me. They would contact Carrie, K-A-R-I, at Mark Woolen, M-A-R-K-W-O-L-Y-N-N.com, and Carrie could tell them um, about the people um, that might be a good fit, um, or... Um, I have a streamable training that I just completed that I'm pretty excited about. We just completed the training and it's ready to stream right there on the website. Yeah. Oh, well, do me a favor and let me know. I'd love to go through it myself. Brilliant. I'd love that. I'd be honored. Yes. Uh, Mark, where can people find you, your book, and are there any special events coming up or anything else you'd like to share with the audience? You just did, which was great, the new streamable. So I'm highly excited. Well, yeah, there's two. There's one. Obviously, my website, markwillin.com, is a great resource for inherited family trauma. But if people are science minded, what I've done on my Facebook page is I've used it to collect all the new uh, amazing studies. Uh, that have been released in the last uh, months and years. And just by following, um, by reading these studies, you'll have a, 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 a very clear idea of what's been happening in this field because it's a new and exciting field. I mentioned one of the studies at Tufts University. Um, there's another one from Journal of American Medicine Psychiatry that's pretty new. All of this is on the Facebook page. Excellent. Mark, this has been one of my favorite podcasts of all times. I really oh. absolutely enjoyed it. And I am so proud of you for your approach, your development, your honesty, the love inside of you, the listening capacity. You've 
really inspired me to to be more of what I can be. So thank you. Oh, Paul, that's really kind words. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. I had a great time just sitting here hanging with you. And yeah. The conversation, as promised, did go deep and went into some <laughs> une- unexpected places. But but I'm, I'm you know I'm happy that we went there. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of you listeners. I hope this touched you as deeply as it touched me. I'm really excited that you got to meet Mark Wu Lin. I'm excited for you to know about his book and his new online course he's releasing. And I'm excited that you know there's a lot of amazing things you can do to really live your life fully and heal yourself and really step into the dream of what you came here to do and experience so that all of us can benefit from your genius. And uh, thank you to all my sponsors who share their love with us and the podcast and all their beautiful products and all their willingness to put money back into organic farming and organic foods. And thank you for anything you buy from them because each purchase that you make supports the podcast with a little commission, which helps me have the time and the ability to find and do the work to get great people like Mark Wu Lin to share with us. And that's love's boomerang. So lots of love to all of you. We are safe. We are home. We are whole. A whole great spirit. It is done. It is done. It is done. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Mark Wolin. You can visit Mark's website to find out more about the Inherited Family Trauma Training Program at markwolin.com. Connect with him on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Mark Wolin. That's M-A-R-K-W-O-L-Y-N-N. Find his book, It Didn't Start With You, at all good bookstores and on Amazon.com. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.